Good evening all and welcome. I'm so very happy that you're able to join us on this occasion. We meet in unusual circumstances and it's not possible for us to do so without giving due heed to the crisis through which we are all persevering. One of the most interesting things that I have remarked is the manner in which people have begun to take notice of the fact that the American people pull together in a crisis. And everywhere one turns, that is being recognized as a sign of strong character, good character. And it is certainly the case that we all ought to be highly appreciative of the way in which people have manifested concern for one another throughout this crisis. It is, however, also worth noting at a moment like this, that indeed it is very important to understand that the ways in which people respond in an emergency, which often shows very fine characteristics, is as much determined by the character they have established prior to the crisis. If one thinks about this on the model of a sailor, a competent sailor who ventures out in the open waters and who knows in a season of calm how important it is to be attentive and prepared, one recognizes what real strength of character means. For the proficient sailor succeeds in the storm because of the character the proficient sailor manifests on a calm sea. And so while we should praise every sign of responsiveness to the emergency, we can't forego reflecting on whether we are merely being coerced by fear or whether we are in fact cashing in accumulated virtues, accumulated treasures of character. And the American Character Project, in which we are here participating and in a way engaged and have been now these past several years, is meant to highlight precisely that question. You have seen, if you joined early enough, the many acknowledgments and descriptions of this project and our gratitude to those who have made it possible. I will rehearse just a few of the important protocol elements. You will see that all the participants are muted. That must be so because it's being recorded and that's how we manage to protect the integrity of the recording. You will also notice that you have a chat application. You should open that activate it, keep it in the corner of your screen somewhere, because you may use that at the conclusion of the lecture to pose questions. I will take the questions from the chat group in order and answer as many as I can in the time that is available to us. So that said, if it becomes necessary for me to get explanation of a question, I can't unmute the questioner and we'll do so and ask the questioner to speak. But otherwise, no one should expect to be participating verbally in the course of the lecture or in the discussion period. We are many gathered and there will likely be others gathering still as we open this. And so there will be occasional moments in which we deflect our attention to be sure everyone who wishes to be in is admitted into this symposium. Uh, it is such a good feeling to be able still to meet with you. And I consider this meeting with you, though I am not presently in Boulder, and if I were, I still couldn't meet with you under the present circumstances. But this meeting signalizes for me a moment of consummation as we have been through a period now of two years of reflecting on the fundamental issues being raised here. So as I raise these issues, I call your attention to the very sense in which 
what you see represented in your screen share, which is the detritus of the Columbian Exposition, that we have to pay due heed to the ways in which we can indeed persevere and maintain our seriousness about the kind of people that we are. Uh, if you revert to the opening screens, you will see in a way part of what I'm talking about. But it is still more manifest in the title page of these remarks, which I'm going to bring to your attention. Those remarks open with this page that you now see before you. So that we have that same image presented. And then you have the title of the lecture and you see as well the definitions of the terms that we're using in this discussion, diversity and liberalism. So I want you to keep those firmly in mind as we proceed. And with that, please allow me to begin. 528 years ago, Christopher Columbus set out in search of a new world not knowing whether he would find people. In the event he discovered a peopled America, he knew neither where he was, he thought it was the Indies, nor who the people were. So he simply denominated them the people of the Indies. 50 years ago, I set out in search of a people, the American people, in a world that I knew, in the event I discovered how very difficult it was to specify who the people were taken all together. Columbus's nautical journey and my intellectual journey converged in the dramatic evidence provided by the 1893 Columbian Exposition, the Great Chicago World's Fair, an illustration from which, as you see, opens the presentation. This illustration, however, reflects not the glorious opening, but the bursting of the illusion of triumph symbolized by the fiery destruction that followed the exposition's closing. The purpose of the exposition had been to herald the entry of the United States onto the commanding heights of world civilization as the culmination of development set in motion by Columbus 401 years previously. But the very staging of the World's Fair inadvertently highlighted far more powerfully the fault lines of society in the United States and perhaps in world civilization altogether. To comprehend the dimensions of cognitive dissonance present at the exposition, we may reflect on the current manifestation of a still more entrenched cognitive dissonance manifested presently in the form of the New York Times 1619 project. The explicit purpose of the, that project is to provide a compelling retelling of the American story that exposes its development as a civilization in the form of a society of the overcoming, pardon me, in the form of a society overcoming systematic oppression at the hands of dominant European culture rooted in what is anachronistically identified as capitalist economics. The fear that capitalism per se is a development or the fact that capitalism per se is a development antecedent to the age of exploration and conquest does not impede the integrating urge of the 1619 project to characterize the American experience as a story of the redeeming power of marginalized groups, and in particular, the positive good that enslaved Africans contributed in building a world historical civilization upon the detritus of European oppression. Unfortunately for the author, Nicole Hannah-Jones and her sponsors at the New York Times, the ground they chose to occupy had been previously commanded by Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells and Frederick Barnett on the occasion of the Columbian Exposition. 
these giants in the struggle against oppression had already invoked 1619 as the ground on which to stand in pressing their claims. They wrote, the exhibit of the progress made by a race in 25 years of freedom as against 250 years of slavery would have been the greatest tribute to the greatness and progressiveness of American institutions, which could have been shown to the world. The colored people of this great Republic number eight millions, more than one tenth the whole population of the United States. They were among the earliest settlers of this continent, landing at Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 in a slave ship, before the Puritans who landed at Plymouth in 1620. They have contributed a large share to American prosperity and civilization. The labor of one half this country has always been is still being done by them. The first credit this country had in its commerce with foreign nations was created by productions resulting from their labor. The wealth created by their industry has afforded to the white people of this country, the leisure essential to their great progress in education, art, science, industry, and invention. Conversely, to the more recent project, however, they, Douglas, Wells, and Barnett, argued for the incorporation of emancipated slaves in the European story rather than for a counter history. In other words, they claimed to recognize what America stood for and promised by abolishing slavery, and they claimed the right to bond with it. They argued, in effect, that the triumphalism of the Columbian Exposition could only be completed by including the notable post-slavery accomplishments of American Blacks in the fair. In fact, however, all such notice was strictly excluded. As in 1896, the nation moved ineluctably toward separate but equal. The Columbian Exposition, in other words, exposed a battle to define the American character as a whole, a labor abandoned by the more recent 1619 project. Thus, the story we have to tell is the story of the movement from separate but equal to separate and equal. So let's start afresh and try to identify an American national character. This work requires less in the form of historical recovery and more in the form of conceptual clarity. We begin, therefore, by clarifying the terms under which we can conduct this inquiry. The very title of the lecture bears interpretation. After all, down with diversity is susceptible to diverse meanings. In the vernacular of the street, it could convey, I'm down with diversity, meaning that I approve of it. Or it could echo shouts of down with the Bastille, conveying an urge to overturn established authority. It might even suggest something as benign as the observation that the sun is going down, perhaps to rise again. But its opposite, liberalism's demise, might be harder to understand. For we often use demise to mean defunct. But it could also convey downfall. More personally, perhaps, we should recur to its etymological origins, which would carry us to the old French demet, and perhaps further still to the Latin demitere. If we take the path, we might see that while dismiss, destroy, or even reduce could translate demise, perhaps nothing would do so more informatively than displace. We suggest in the title, therefore, that the dynamic involved in the relationship between diversity and liberalism is that diversity's effect is to displace liberalism. Undertaking to account for the displacement effect of diversity. We should initially remind ourselves of what the previous presenters in the American National Character Lecture Series have suggested regarding our general theme. In the beginning, Diana Shaw developed the importance of Booker T. Washington's contribution to our self-understanding. In that regard, nothing was more significant than her observation that Washington's labors are misconstrued as exerted on behalf of his people. If we understand by that locution only American Blacks, his artful constructions envisioned a future for the whole, not for a part. Thus, 
Schaub encapsulated his bridge building statesmanship in the formulation, Washington advised both groups on how they ought to handle themselves. His message stressed the need for law abidingness on all sides. Blacks, he says, must remain patient, law abiding, and self-controlled as Lincoln was. Whites, meanwhile, must cease to inflict injustice upon the Negro because he is a Negro or because he is weak. Every act of injustice seeks to pull down the great temple of justice and law and order, which Lincoln gave his life to secure. Washington sought accordingly to build unity through the common attachment of all on the basis of political community informed by ideas of liberty. Colleen Sheehan next introduced the idea of civic friendship as that dynamic was identified and propagated by the greatest theoretician of the founding, James Madison. In the course of her remarks, she particularly demonstrated that Madison's views of republicanism explain not merely the mechanics, but the necessary conditions of self-government. That civic friendship was a necessary condition implicated the requirements to develop a friendship sustaining character among the citizens. Although Madison, as statesman rather than theoretician, was not a character building founder, and toward the end of his life, I might say, uh, somewhat despairing about prospects of reconciling the poor and the rich on the one hand and the free and the slave on the other, he nevertheless understood and taught that the prospects for a successful experiment in self-government must depend upon such an accomplishment. Now at this point, Robert Zimmer entered the conversation and focused specifically on the secular clerisy that seemed most to hold in its hands the capacity to develop precepts of civic friendship. He did so in the context of identifying the university as having lost its commitment to its mission by means of substituting a heedless commitment to diversity at the cost of free inquiry. Insofar as it is true that the university had long since become, as Edward Schills once argued, the culture's new clerisy, Zimmer's argument meant that it no longer fulfilled its goal since the pursuit of its distinctive mission was the means by which it could reinforce attachment to the mission of the common culture. His account of the specific experience at the University of Chicago, therefore, was not a parochial account, but an appraisal of the challenges faced by higher education throughout the country, challenges in the face of which higher education is failing. That failure consisted precisely in the university's abandonment of responsibility to foster those elements of character, such as hardihood in the face of dissentient views, essential to the development of common understandings and collaborative undertakings. The breakdown highlighted by Zimmer in the universities was underscored in the realm of politics by Danielle Allen, who shone a bright light on the need for a supermajority to sustain constitutional democracy. Returning tacitly to the theme of civic friendship, Allen suggested that the country was challenged to develop means to re-engage citizens in common purposes as a specific means by which to reanimate those elements of character required to navigate successfully the tensions inherent in a civic body consisting of diverse interests. Accordingly, she urged approaches to forge a common story, the shared inheritance of all Americans, as the specific required for a reanimating architecture. These helpful presentations bear the burden of the unspoken legacy of Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 Supreme Court case that introduced the political project of separate but equal and legitimized the practice of Jim Crow. In other words, a few short years after the Columbian Exposition, the United States committed to a project of building separate people, indeed physically separate, while affecting still to affirm the principle of equality that lay at the basis of its wholeness, civic friendship and common purpose. The nation struggled for the next 50 years through legal and political challenges deriving from the explosive charges inherent in that ill-fated project, 
In Brown versus Board of Education, the court declared in 1954 that physically separate was inherently unequal. That is, it declared the project logically impossible. What followed that development, however, has been a moral and intellectual mystery, which we are only just beginning to unravel. A mystery that goes to the heart of clarifying the question of what is the American national character. In the aftermath of Brown, the Board of Education, the nation devoted two decades in the attempt to replace the logical impossibility of separate but equal with an articulate account of wholeness of a fully integrated civic body. Those labors climaxed in the famous apothem of Martin Luther King that America's children should be judged not by the color of the skin, but by the content of their character. His recourse to the founding principles of the United States, above all the Declaration of Independence, heralded an effort to identify the appreciation of self-governing character as the common possession of a people in full possession of their inalienable natural rights. The mystery lies in the reality that the country was deflected from that course by a series of events rendering less likely than ever the emergence of a common unifying purpose in the broad civic body, the supermajority. Two such dynamics bear particularly on this account. The one introduced diversity management as the principal axis of social relationship in the country, and the other, initiated background citizen shaping dynamics that forward the ground in which the diversity seeds were planted. The unfolding of these processes will complete the presentation of this talk. It would be well, however, first to underscore the emergence of the discourse of diversity itself in relation to the Jim Crow regime to which it succeeded. It is a commonly understood fact that diversity as a tool of legal reference and social description gains its principal force from the 1978 Supreme Court decision in Bakke versus California. And in particular, in the opinion of the very patrician Justice Lewis F. Powell. Powell succeeded in squaring the circle, replacing the discredited separate but equal with a tacit separate and equal. What lay at the foundation of his introduction of diversity was the recognition that not physical, but conceptual separation was needed to reinforce desirable patterns of social relationship. On the basis of conceptual separation, i.e. the affirmation of difference, it became possible to acknowledge complete legal equality, including physical proximity, without yielding to claims of community. With the fine sense of the patrician that he was, Powell engineered a pattern of relationship predicated upon caretaking of those common citizens who were not in fact the social equals of their overlords. Diversity was the name applied to a shepherding relationship through which the distinction between the shepherds and the sheep could be pristinely maintained. I will return to examine the consequences of this turn of events in the form of diversity management, the cadre of actual lowly shepherds at the end of these remarks. But now it is well, and it will be helpful to ponder the intersection between diversity manage management and a brief intellectual flurry of 50 years ago, namely the advocacy of consociation as the principle in accord with which the civic body should be organized. I owe to Paul Sarvis the timely reminder of this now forgotten foray into social engineering. What consociation proposed was an organization of society into subgroups predicated on identity affiliation with representatives of those groups exercising the deliberative responsibilities of government through their bargaining and competitive relationships. That proposal was the outgrowth of a period of overemphasis on pluralism, in which an underlying social dynamic was misconstrued as a necessary political dynamic. 
the development of diversity management is a truncated version of the vision of consociation. Insofar as the diversity managers are not the political leaders of the society, but rather only the head, the lowly shepherds. But the massive development of such cadres in every important institution, educational, corporate, religious, military, governmental, testifies mightily to the derailing or displacing effect that diversity has had. And that effect is summarized in the expression I have included in these remarks, that we have moved from e pluribus unum to ex unius plures. In reality, the successful introduction of diversity was made possible by antecedent statesmanship of world historical magnitude. We've laid out the broad outlines of that process in previous contributions to the American National Character Project. For example, in the arc of justice, I observed that a constitution can sustain its formal existence without sustaining its dynamic existence. And in that case, a constitution that exists in form but not in dynamic substance has substantially or in substance ceased to exist. In much the same way that a dry seabed no longer conveys to an ocean in anything but memory. Further, discussion about the characteristics of democratic government in particular carry the burden less to describe the dynamics of the relationships between citizens and the state apparatus than to describe the dynamics of the relations among citizens themselves. It is the unmediated character of the citizen body that determines the prospects for democratic governing. And finally, that the symbiotic interaction between human personal development and the development of human community will be a surprise only to those who launch political speculations from an abstract perspective. For nothing could be more natural than to recognize the culmination of organized systems in their incipient formations. Incontestably, the incipient formation of human communities lies in the genesis of the persons themselves. It feels almost childish to repeat such observations. But in an age in which academic tendencies obscure foundational reasoning, it cannot hurt to remind us who we are. The process has been made clearer still, however, by the contribution of Stephen Cambon in this lecture series. Cambon was very successfully laid out a schematic that illustrated the transition from George Washington through Abraham Lincoln, through Theodore Roosevelt, through Franklin Roosevelt, in a manner that powerfully demonstrates how the American people in the effect upon their character were prepared to receive a new founding that particularly suited the regime of diversity management. In a word, Cambon described two courses of political development. The one from Washington through Lincoln emphasized unity in government deriving from an overwhelming sense of community in purpose, which the government itself was constrained to follow rather than to lead, albeit acknowledging the role of statesmanship in fostering fit sentiment. That ideal had been captured in the model e pluribus unum. That course was succeeded by the one initiated by Theodore Roosevelt, who believed that subsequent changes, these are his words, to civil society created threats to individual rights that cannot be addressed by individuals in their customary roles, nor by a federalized system of government. The threats to democracy that had arisen affected all, and therefore could only be addressed by a new national government. His statesmanship, his actions and rhetoric lent force to a principle, and then moved the public to adopt it as their own by virtue of their approbation of his actions, which in turn, required a reshaping of the American national character. What Campbell means here is that the governmental pyramid was inverted to align the people as supporting the weight of government authority instead of government supporting the weight of the people's authority. 
from Theodore Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson to Franklin Roosevelt and all the way up to Barack Obama, Campbell identified a central vector, government acting on behalf of the individual, which bore on the ultimate relationship between citizen and government. We must, however, observe that the individual remains at the center of political life in the United States. The critique of unguided individualism that informed Theodore Roosevelt's program and continued through his successes was nevertheless a critique that identified the individual per se as the constituent element of political life. That extended so far as even to be heralded by Barack Obama as the power of the individual in his Berlin address of 2013. His specific reference was that government exists to serve the power of the individual and not the other way around. The question that Cambon has posed, therefore, is what does it mean to say that government serves the power of the individual in an era of identity politics and diversity management? The answer is provided in the middle term of this analysis which returns us to our point of departure, namely the second dynamic that responded to the logical impossibility of separate but equal. That was the logic of ex unius pluris, breaking the whole, the union, into its component parts. The second dynamic was derived from Franklin Roosevelt's consummation of the project opened by Theodore Roosevelt in his enunciation of the new administrative state. But upon a rereading of the Declaration of Independence, a second Bill of Rights, and the identification of governmental responsibility as primary in securing the blessings of liberty. Cambon presented those developments in detail. All were summed up, however, in his restatement of the 1944 State of the Union fireside chat, in which Roosevelt celebrated the new promise of public support for individual welfare across all meaningful dimensions of life, save religion, and worldwide. The resulting program was a mandate of public provision for universally applicable individual well being. The power of the individual consists entirely in organizing to compel government to make such provision. And the relationship is symbiotic. The more individuals are directly served by government, the more they will support the authority of government. The society became less a civic community of self-governing souls and more a gigantic hospital ward. And more importantly, the character of the citizens became irrelevant to the character of the government, which alone bears the person of the nation. The development then, this development, constitutes the fertile ground out of which diversity management grew. For as a matter of practical necessity, random and equal individuals cannot be well choreographed in a broad pattern of any kind, whether of civic friendship or collective decision-making. The more they can be sorted and confined in subgroups, however, the more readily can their virtual energies be appropriated to sustain the administrative apparatus required for undertakings on the scale envisioned by Roosevelt. And we need not say that Franklin Roosevelt fully understood this implication of the program he pursued. It suffices that it logically follows to identify his fertile contributions to the political direction of the United States as the decisive change in conditions that gave warrant to trends otherwise present but not otherwise gaining purchase. That is, Postmodernist ideas of the end of man would have resembled seeds sown on rocky ground rather than vigorous shoots of community destroying ideologies in the absence of the fertile soil sown by cultivated dependence and victimhood. This logical consequence was made plainly evident when President Lyndon Johnson responded to the emerging civil rights demands of American Blacks with a declaration that said as much about citizens in general as it said about Black citizens. Here are his words. 
Well, the task is to give 20 million Negroes the same chance as every other American to learn and grow, to work and share in society, to develop their abilities, physical, mental, and spiritual, and to pursue their individual happiness. And he continued, to this end, equal opportunity is essential, but not enough. Not enough. Men and women of all races are born with the same range of abilities. But ability is not just the product of birth. Ability is stretched or studded by the family that you live with and the neighborhood you live in, by the school you go to and the poverty or the richness of your surroundings. It is the product of a hundred unseen forces playing upon the little infant, the child, and finally the man. The first passage in Johnson's declaration builds upon the foundations of liberalism as previously understood, security for the individual pursuit of happiness. The second passage, equal opportunity is not enough, however, denies the efficacy of the individual pursuit of happiness by conditioning human happiness. Pardon me, I had to let some people into the meeting. By conditioning human agency on previously established cultivation. The minor premise denies the major premise in this syllogism. It is, of course, a truism that background resources play significantly upon foreground accomplishments. But the activities of mining and refining play far more decisively upon outcomes and therefore pinpoint individual exertion and agency as the privileged components of human competence or proficiency. Any good physician understands that a patient who presents in crisis likely has a long history of antecedent causes that engendered the crisis. The physician also knows though, that numerous opportunities for prior intervention presented that could have averted the crisis. The outright denial of that demonstrable truth is the dramatic foundation upon which all identity politics and diversity management stand. What rushes into the vacuum? created by the denial is the false science of otherness. I call it a false science because it is couched in a putatively scientific terminology that is technical jargon that has foundation in no recognizable demonstration or methodology. It is in fact almost a dead giveaway that its most prominent practitioners and extraordinarily numerous adepts challenge ordinary expectations of what it means to produce groundbreaking scientific discoveries. That is, such things are rare and difficult to comprehend for the average intellect. The fact that diversity management is thickly populated with average and less than average intellects is sure indication that its scientific pretenses are false. Just consider the originating privilege discourse drawn from McIntyre's empty backpack in the 1997 book, Making Meaning of Whiteness. The meanings drawn from it in the exercise of exposing unconscious whiteness are in reality only the results of confirmation bias. Inducing researchers to fill the backpack with untested and unchallenged preconceptions, an example appears in a doctoral dissertation by a Canadian educator, I will quote, Whiteness, as referred to in this study, is an ideology that is all encompassing and functions as the invisible norm or normalcy. It was and is still developed through histories of colonialism, imperialism, classism, and capitalism, and is systematically reproduced. It is throughout these histories that whiteness becomes invested and substantiated in an identity based on power, oppression, privilege, social class, domination of knowledge, construction, and reproduction. Whiteness, therefore, is the center and difference is regulated to the margins and is known as the norm that represents an authoritative, delimited, and hierarchical mode of thought. The author acknowledges, however, and moreover, that the identification of this social dynamic derives from denaturalizing customary cultural references, which means denying any rational foundations for them. Is 
Upon such foundations as these that we observe the cultivated discourse of division, social segmentation, that is conveyed by terms such as white privilege, intersectionality, microaggression, marginalization, safe spaces, and so on. This discourse treats all reference to social norms or the very idea of what is normal as identity formations expressing either domination or subjection. In other words, there is no whole, no common good in any politically shaped society. There is only the ersatz Marxist struggle of competing identities. All thought is socially hierarchical in form and effect. Please feel free to inquire, what does this matter? Are not all people, all citizens anywhere, human beings? Do not all operate on the same natural basis of character? I shall repeat. It is a very claim, that claim, that is denied in the arguments that sustain identity politics and diversity management. And even if the universally, universalizing argument is correct regarding the foundations of human character, we would still require to respond to the postmodern skeptic who denies that there is some universal form or nature called human. More precisely, that advanced intelligence teaches that the idea of a human in the term human rights is a mere social construct, a cultural imposition, a result we may suspect that Roosevelt never recognized when giving it the specific currency he gave it. Indeed, the infantry in this end of man revelatory crusade refer to such universal concepts as mere Western or European ideology that operates to silence the narrative histories of non-Westerners or non-Europeans. The infantry in the end are not important for purposes of analysis. They easily fire blindly the locutions deriving from their postmodern overlords. Their discourse of cultural appropriation and such, without any real knowledge of the vacuity, the meaninglessness of what they say, precisely because they are the lowly foot soldiers, the shepherds and the cadres of diversity management, they are lilyputs dressed in the armor of Saul and burdened with McIntyre's empty backpack. I say the shepherds do not matter in themselves, that is. But it would be foolish to overlook the massive investment in resources that could otherwise be put to good use in sustaining these battalions. But to focus upon those who play bit roles in this drama will miss the point. They are not self-sustaining. The C-suite denizens of our educational, business, military, governmental, and religious institutions are the real culprits. They have embraced false notions of character and community, and they have displaced liberalism with identity politics. While in the broader context, one may learn from the nativity scene that it is important to embrace magi and shepherds in a comprehensive view of the promise announced to the world on that occasion, one must still take note of the difference in status between the magi and the shepherds. King Herod did not summon the shepherds to learn where the danger lay and neither should we. However, not even the hapless CEO, president, chancellors who govern our cultural bulwarks can answer to the greater demands of this season. That is the reason I have emphasized the character shaping significance of statesmanship. But even our well-heeled magi of today exist under the larger sway of a national character that has been steeped in victimhood as a direct consequence of the corrupting direction contemporary government entered into when it conceived the citizens as patients to be tended rather than masters to be heeded. The prevailing tendency to formulate these matters in terms of contemporary political competition reacts appropriately to the reality on the ground, but they misconceive the dimensions of the problem. What hangs in the balance is not the matter of a political victory by one side or the other, neo-progressives over conservatives or vice versa. Rather, the question is whether the possibility of political community, of union, shall remain viable. A recent commentary by Sharon Ward raised this issue in the most trenchant manner. And she observed, liberals think conservatives are deplorable. 
conservatives think liberals are insane. Attacking our faith in God and our commitment to the Constitution and the Second Amendment wasn't enough for them. Apparently, they want to rob Americans not only of who they have been as a society for centuries, but also of the very essence of who they are as human beings. Ward proposed a live and let live response to this conundrum predicated upon a reading of constitutional federalism as a principle for accommodating heterogeneous cultural and social views. Unfortunately, that does not offer a solution for the greater problem. But the elements of character relied upon to establish the nation did not entail a conformity of views or preferences. They rather entailed habits that reinforce mutual confidence and reliance, that sense of decency and commitment to justice that enables individuals to find their own good in attending to the good of others. The federal structure facilitated expanding the opportunities for citizens to take responsibility for themselves individually and in community, as Alexis de Tocqueville observed. But it stood upon a soundness of character that enabled the people to grow together in exertions of decency and self-sufficiency. An early test of the sufficiency of that arrangement arose during the War of 1812, with the tensions emerging between the Madison administration and certain New England dissenters. But that soon waned. A more serious challenge to the prospects of such unity and community arose when the evanescent disintegration that produced the Civil War emerged. But Lincoln brought the country through with a dedication to a new birth of freedom. Each of those challenges assumed the form of challenge through institutional resistance, state governments or parties. The divisions that concern war today are of a different cast. While the identity groups may appear at one glance to be constituencies, they are in reality only atomized and alienated individuals standing alone in the face of power with political, no political or institutional recourse. The reason they will continue to multiply virally under present conditions is that their very existence is based on a dynamic of mutation. These last men, to use Nietzsche's phrase, derive no support from being black white or brown, heterosexual, homosexual, polymorphous, gendered or gelded, sectarian or atheist, and so on ad infinitum. They seek cover in putative identities only because there's nothing left of them. They have no independent ground of character on which to stand. Because what they do, their deeds no longer matter. And character is a matter of being recognized for what one accomplishes. The Tenth Amendment's federal solution will not summon character from the grave. In the face of this reality, the true alternative is not alternative politics, but rather victory or subjection. Our reality, I must say, is that either diversity must go or liberalism. The individual pursuit of happiness must disappear. Stephen Campbell captured it well when he summarized his observations as follows. The society of victimhood inherited from Roosevelt's refounding effort has certainly created in the United States and potentially worldwide a sense of entitlement that ill comports with any very lively embrace of rules of civility and decent behavior. But such rules begin with the recognition of the claims of others as prior to any claim to act in one's own behalf. Indeed, it is their very purpose to create the foundation of acting in one's own behalf in deliberations about the necessity of the civil order, deliberating about the just and the unjust, the advantageous and the disadvantageous. I would be pleased to close by giving Campbell the last word, but that would unfairly imply some degree of responsibility to the, be attributed to him for these remarks that are in some respects rather caustic and in that not to be imputed to him. Accordingly, I return to the beginning. The Columbian Exposition, as we saw, went up in smoke, necessarily raising the question of whether the noble experiment of the United States had proved no less illusory than the Exposition's claims of grandeur. I provide here, accordingly, the dramatic tableau that was created, that was created to project the comprehensive significance of the Exposition, inviting attention to its details.
ponder that, pause over it, look at it. Columbia awaits the wreath of triumph being flown in by the eagle. While flaring the stars and stripes before the admiring gazes of the founding giants, the current president, Cleveland, and world civilization. The insignia of discovery, technology, and the rule of law, Corpus Iuris, surround her. At her feet lies a scale representation of the exposition itself. The flag Columbia flares echoes the flag furled about George Washington. A Jefferson-like figure, Columbus that is, positioned between Washington and Lincoln, fondles the globe beneath one hand and unfurls with the other a map of the entire Western Hemisphere. Abraham Lincoln looks upon the display with serene composure and Excelsior, bearing a torch, points to Columbia as Europe's successor, albeit surely echoing Longfellow of 1841, and Whitman's parody, perhaps, of Longfellow of uncertain date. The narrative in this tableau is a narrative of unchecked progress. Interestingly, that is the narrative that both Roosevelt's took up when declaring the frontier closed and dedicated the nation's future progress to reformulating its government and the people's relationship to their government. That fire that consumed the Columbian Exposition cannot fail to spark presentments about the fire next time the fire that will greet the next great claim of progress. And I will not leave you with those remarks. I will take your questions and I will see if I can scroll through them to get to the very beginning. I have a few here. So there we are. Uh, and there are some people waiting. They're a little late, but perhaps they can get the YouTube where it will be posted subsequently. Um, give me a moment and I will see. Someone said they cannot see me in the presentation mode. We just see your PowerPoint. Uh, I'm sorry about that. It's too late now for me to do anything about it. Uh, someone comments on the 1619 project being done in the early 70s by progressives and communists of the title Time on the Cross. Uh, that is a uh, confusion of circumstances. As I said, it was summoned in 1893, well before then, and Time on the Cross was a major historical contribution to which John Jocko responded, and which was therefore appropriately discussed not only 1619, but many other questions, and most importantly, whether slavery had been an economic success. But that is another story. I do not see a further question in, in that rather long contribution. Maybe I'm coming to one at the end. Uh, is not this diversity on the left the same evil? The same evil as Germany, Hitler's willing executionists, identified social attitudes which made anti Semitism rapid and common. Ah, certainly, I have no trouble seeing that there is a kinship between the diversity management I've discussed and the practices undertaken by those in Hitler's Germany. But I would caution that one should avoid the argument Hitlerum as a distraction from the discussion of what it means to be an American, which is ultimately far more important than what evils have been done elsewhere in the world. The next question. For educators, how can we reinforce in our students whatever civic bonds may be forged among Americans during this pandemic? And can diversity be a tool for this reinforcement? I think diversity not only cannot be a tool for but we see already underway a massive effort of rent seeking built on diversity arguments. In just the last few days, you've got a long wish list uh, that has been published by groups under the banner of assorted organizations representing the uh, usual suspects in the uh, arena of the defense, particularly of black uh, civil rights and other expectations, uh, who are, for example, charting out the discussion about the disproportionate effect upon Black people of the COVID-19 infection, uh, where, of course, what they're actually talking about is a long-established disproportion of certain morbidities, which happens to be comorbidities, 
with the coronavirus, but they want to make it appear as if this were something that somehow were affecting black people because of systemic injustices rather than seeing the, the circumstances for what they are. So, so no, I don't think diversity can be a tool to reinforce civic bonds. I think that unless people are asked to do the things which they can themselves do based on strength of character, you're not really asking anything of them. Uh, let me illustrate that for you. It's, I've said in the previous contributions in this project that there are really only uh, five essential elements of personal character which together form the foundation of American national character. And those are decency, forbearance, industry, fortitude, and justice. Now, you are going to summon decency, forbearance, industry, fortitude, and justice by asking people to begin by asking what groups they belong to. You're going to summon them by asking people to take responsibility for themselves. So no, I, I do not at all think that diversity will reinforce the elements of character that we're looking for. Uh, there is an observation being made by Dodge, but I don't really see a question, uh, which talks about, of course, the troubles of the 1960s and 70s and the ways in which the various ethnic studies programs were put in place during the disputes of those years. And let me emphasize something I've said before. Yes, I understand that there is what we might say an on the ground history of the emergence of the diversity um, movement in the country that bears paying attention to. But if one doesn't ask, what is the soil out of which those movements grew? One is missing the point. It is really not terribly important that there are people who wave the flag of diversity. It's only important of how the flag was raised to begin with, who, who was the Betsy Ross uh, for the diversity flag? That's the question that matters ultimately. And so seeing this in the context of the postmodernist expectation of the end of man, the end of history, and the irrelevance of the individual is extremely important to respond to it. So, so while one can identify uh, mouth uh, misfeasance all along the way of any particular social issue, one doesn't necessarily respond to the issue by doing that. One responds to the issue with a kind of supererogatory advance beyond the ground. The next question, are you saying uh, someone should have done more on the job to stand that others could look to? Uh, I'm not quite sure I can quite uh, decode that one. But I certainly would always recommend others to take a look at the stand that Harry Jaffa took. Now, maybe there's a reference to a bill here that I don't know which bill it is that we're talking about, or maybe these people are just talking to one another and not asking me a question. So I can't quite follow that one, I'll go on. Uh, uh, there's a comment about commenting on the fight over the uh, centennial of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that, that has some significance somewhere along the way, but again, there's not a question posed. Uh, then there's this question. Uh, let's see, now, now Dawes, you're getting in rather often, but that's not a question, that's an observation about Elijah Cummins and Clarence Thomas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, who was an Uncle Tom, who was a liberal? Okay, that, that's a comment, that's fine, and others can read that. I'm looking for questions. What should the next fire of progress look like or clear the field to allow. Uh, I, I hope that what I have made uh, clear to at least to a limited extent is that the next fire will be a consuming fire. I don't think in terms of uh, restoring uh, community health as a matter of uh, conflagration. I think it as a matter of prevented, prevention. And so I'm more concerned with fire prevention than igniting a fire uh, at this stage. If fire comes, it will be because our efforts to prevent a fire fail. Uh, can you elaborate on your comments regarding habits being what kept us together in the end during civil war as opposed to views? What does this say about what we face today? 
Well, what I mean by that is that during the period of the Civil War, what led up to the Civil War was Lincoln engaging mightily in uh, the public with regard to habits that he saw as corrosive and destructive, uh, which he referred to in his debates with uh, Stephen A. Douglas as blowing out the moral lights among us. It is this blowing out the moral lights. That was the undermining of good habits that Lincoln was assaulting. And so what Lincoln understood himself to be accomplishing and what I can think we may say he significantly accomplished was to restore the commitment to the foundation principles, the axiom of the Declaration of Independence, of human equality, and the expectation that consent of the governed has to be the foundation. And those two things sometimes seem to people not to consort well together, but Lincoln insisted they had to, and that we had to renew our commitment to them, and that that would be the foundation of saving the nation from the direct disastrous course it was settled upon. So it seems to me those are the important habits. It is not the habits of, how, of let me say, courtesy and deference. You don't find those in the list of the five elements of character that I mentioned. Uh, it, it is rather the habits that serve to weld a disparate people into a coherent community. Those are the habits that are important. Uh, the next question says, we just lost screen share. I don't know why, but uh, I, I, I think the program has ended. That may be the only reason for this that I can contemplate, but I'll go on just for a moment. Can you elaborate on your comment regarding habits? No, and we got that. On the um, unimportance of argumentum at Hitler and type arguments, could you extend that? Should we agree with Tolstoy that all happy families are happy in the same way? All other things are you know, something else. Uh, yes, what, I, what I'm saying is when we argue with reference to examples from elsewhere, we often do so at the expense of paying attention to ourselves as to who we are. And so, so what I'm uh, suggesting is not that what one says about Hitler is wrong, but that it is not always apposite to the particular question that we face. Uh, people throw terms like brown shirts around with great casual ease. I don't find that that's very instructive. Uh, there are people who are engaged in things that are dangerous to the country, uh, but who in fact do not do them because their objective is to overturn or endanger the country. That must be understood. As I said before, I think it is important to realize that uh, Woodrow Wilson, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not have to understand all the implications of what he was doing in order for him to do something that was ill-considered. And that's the important thing for us. Or as I said in the first Federalist Papers, it's the argument that matters, not the motive. And we must constantly tell ourselves that. There are people who do the right thing with bad motives and people who do the wrong thing with good motives. Our job is to figure out the difference between right and wrong. Uh, the next question, might not diversity be the key to unlocking the promise of liberalism? One suggestion is that bringing people, for example, diverse through the body of the universe could help shape the national character over time. That small town white man will come to share interest with the city movement. But that argument is a restatement of the basic belief of the diversity managers. I think I have laid out the fundamental error in that argument. Thinking that you're going to take people first by identifying them on their presumptive cultural inheritance and then shape them by exposing them to someone else's presumptive cultural inheritance means that you don't consider them as human beings who can be approached as human beings. It is dehumanizing. I can't say it in any softer terms than that. The temptation, and I understand there might be some good hearted impulse involved in this question, but the temptation to think that we can sort people in this manner and improve them by doing so is only a temptation that we can experience when we fail to see them as people, fail to want to engage them as individuals. So no, I'm, I'm not interested in whether a small town white man can come to share the interest with the city norm black, because I don't think that there's any barrier to their communicating with one another and they don't require to be shepherded by diversity managers into a relationship that they cannot find on their own. It is indeed fairly insulting to have that 
expressed as a wish. Uh, Steve Haywood here, if there here is one step a college president approval should take, what would it be and would they get away with it? Oh yes, quite, quite clearly. Uh, what they should do is reassign their diversity managers into useful occupations, period. They should dismantle that entire, you know, I came out to Denver to speak to the University of Colorado system in 2007 in their annual diversity workshop. And I gave them a substantial presentation in the keynote address telling them that diversity was undermining the mission of the university. They were going the wrong direction. I urged them to instead drop diversity and embrace inclusivity if they wanted to reaffirm the degree of moral commitment that seemed to underlie what they had expressed in attaching themselves to diversity. Well, uh, they heard me. They did adopt inclusivity. They just added it to diversity without ever questioning, looking back, investigating what wrong signals were being sent by the diversity concept itself. So, so I think it's time for them finally to say, okay, we didn't quite respond then, but now it's time to respond. How can someone bring someone marinated in diversity belief back to belief in common good, American virtues, et cetera? Well, that, that is of course is the most difficult question of the evening. Uh, I believe it's possible to say that there is no uh, magic bullet here. That this is a real uh, labor of Hercules. Uh, I'm hoping it's not Sisyphean in character, uh, which is to say that no matter how hard we try, we find we have to do it all over again. But I hope it is responsive to genuinely Herculean effort of confronting people with the challenge to take people seriously as individuals, to, to treat each as being owed fully the respect that the human being as a human being is owed before trying to cabin them in some category, which is merely ascribed and not one that they have earned through their own conduct. Pay attention to the things that people do, let them build their reputations, reward them for good reputations, discourage bad reputations. That's how you get them out of diversity belief. Uh, is there a way to explore and appraise the desires, motives, and aspirations that lead to intense embrace of identity politics and to redirect and channel those desires, motives, and aspirations toward a promising national character? I'm sorry I read that so fast, but it was it seemed long at first. Uh, yes, yes, that there is a way to explore and appraise the desires, motives, and aspirations that lead to embracing identity politics. And, and that is to say by bringing people face to face with them. Uh, because I think that there are enough people whose motives are healthy that they would themselves be embarrassed to believe that what they are doing is indeed counterindicated, contraindicated, and that they would change course if they had a meaningful understanding that the course they were following was in fact destroying rather than building the edifice they sought to erect. So, so that would be my response. And I think. I'm glad to get that question because I'd like to remind people again, as often as I can, that it is not necessary to dismiss people with whom one disagrees as people who cannot understand. Uh, one will start out with the assumption that they can understand. And, and that is the same assumption that is uh, redolent in the Declaration of Independence and made explicit in its exordium when it appeals to the decent respect to the opinions of mankind. They don't mean by that, that all opinions of all human beings are decent. They mean that all human beings are capable of decency, capable of reason, capable of understanding, and ought to be entrusted to understand. So one must carry the arguments to people and carry them consistently and with strength of reason. Ah, oh, yes. Is there any other way to begin building personal character without making an appeal to moral effort? The fact that we cannot even speak of moral effort without provoking controversy. Yes, I, I think part of what is being uh, presented over the course of this entire project is an argument that certainly, first of all, uh, establishes the moral foundations. Uh, and that's what I did in 2014 when I uh, developed an, a, a thorough philosophical uh, 
uh, appraisal of what was going on among us. But the fact is, when we were talking about the on the ground engagement with people, we don't have to go back to the beginning and ask them whether they're moral or immoral. <laughs> we, we rather have to present them opportunities to display their gifts. And those gifts include the gift of being moral. And the way, best way for me to illustrate this is to say the following. As I said at the outset, when I use the example of a sailor, I could have used other examples. It is, it is not the, uh, it is not the virtuosity that might be displayed in an emergency that counts. Uh, we don't acquire courage at the moment of battle. We acquire courage long before we get into battle. And it is those small daily steps that lead to acquiring courage that prepare us for battle. And so the kinds of character we need to encourage and foster are those daily affirmations of decency, daily affirmations of forbearance, daily affirmations of industry, daily affirmations of fortitude and of justice. And I want to underscore what I said in the formal remarks. Yes, liberalism, the whole project, the goal, the ideal of liberalism is the individual pursuit of happiness. As I said in the essay, the end of is the happiness is the end. What is important to understand is that one cannot find that happiness without embracing one's willingness to foster the good of another. That, that, that is simply part component part of the attainment of happiness. So happiness is not something that one can enjoy outside of community and as a mere atom. So reinforcing those things that there is a real work to do if one cares for oneself, that that is what the acquisition of the elements of character are. When George Washington urged building a national character, he did it specifically in the context in which he was making clear to the citizens themselves that it depended on them. They had to do this. They had to acquire the humility he invokes at the end of the circular address in 1783. They had to acquire the sense of justice he described in that same address. They had to acquire the fortitude to see through times of trouble. So that, yes, there are daily activities that represent the acquisition of character, which only will be undertaken and considered important if we think the individual can acquire these characteristics. If we think the individuals can only manifest cultural backgrounds and not acquire personal character, then of course we'll never undertake it at all. So the real thing, the real difference is recognizing that people are not just expressions of the conditions from which they sprung, that Lyndon B. Johnson was simply wrong about that. Okay, oh, come on. Uh, that's a rather incoherent observation and not a question as far as I can tell. I think, oh, well, it does make the claim that the diversity has been a success at West Point and the Naval Academy. I think that's greatly mistaken, but that's another question and we'll go through that in another time. Uh, when you hear a student rubbish the Declaration of Independence for the usual cliche reasons, what is the first question or proposition you use to begin unraveling this disaster. I, I always, they, they always are concerned most of all with all men are created equal and the supposedly exclusive character of the declaration's use of the word men. And I take them immediately to Thomas Jefferson's draft of the document and the clause describing slaves in all capital letters as men. And he said, these men are being stolen out of Africa and transshipped into the Western hemisphere. And I point out to them, You'd have to be a, as dull as a stone to think that Thomas Jefferson did not know that the slaves being sent from Africa were women and children as well as men. And that he used the same language when he said all men are created equal, that he used it universally. And once the student sees that, they are at square one, they have to start all over, and they can find the answer for themselves once they get rid of that great big blot of ignorance. Let's see. Okay, that's another 
Uh, there's one prolific person who's more interested in commenting than asking a question, so I'll go on. Uh, yes, that's great. Good. That's confirmation. Is there any significance that this lecture is being delivered on Thomas Jefferson's birthday? Well, everything is always significant. Uh, if you heard the question, is it significant that the lecture is being delivered on Jefferson's birthday? My answer is everything is always significant. Next question, how to develop a shared community? Are we doing a somewhat good job in having a grace? Ah, well, <laughs> that's a very particular, not to say parochial question. Uh, it, it, the implication of the question is, uh, if on the local level, are there things that we can do that foster this sense of community that can, as it were, uh, constitute building blocks? that would formulate part of the architecture of a national character? And the answer is yes, uh, because we are as guilty at the local level of ignoring the requirement, the requisites of character in terms of building community projects, policies, regulations, and laws, as we are at the national level. We have tended to embrace expediency rather than the what is permissible under constitutional forms as our rule of conduct. So if we begin by saying, let's always start by asking what is permitted for us to do, rather than starting by asking what is theoretically conceivable as nice to do, we will find ourselves in a much stronger position. And that's true in Habit of Grace. And there are some specifics I could mention in Habit of Grace, but, but I don't want the, this particular talk to become too parochial in that regard. And if you will email me subsequently, I will share with you some comments about things that we're not doing correctly and have a grace at the moment. Uh, why has the original structure of the diversity quandary? Why has the original structure of the diversity quandary expounded in MLK's letter from the Birmingham jail and closed by Goldwater's extremism and defense of liberties and vice, moderation in the pursuit of justice, the end all Socratic? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, and I don't think I can do what I normally do in the classroom, which is converted into something that you would find helpful, even though I can't understand the question. <laughs> I can only say that you've uh, strung together a series of things that don't necessarily seem to have a connection with one another. And if you want to explore through email, you can come back to me on that. Do you think diversity can advance the aims of liberation in this way? A young black man who still suffers the wrongs of slavery and Jim Crow would not otherwise have had the opportunity to develop his talents had he not been admitted to university partly for the sake of the diversity he would bring to the campus. This might be one way that diversity management and actually respects an individual on the basis of what he is owed and his character and what he can do if given the chance. Uh, I, th that question, of course, is a restatement of what are the, uh, the strongest arguments ever given in defense of diversity, i.e., Clarence Thomas would not be on the Supreme Court if he had not been an affirmative action admit to the Yale Law School. Both comments to that effect, which we've heard so often. Uh, I, I will tell you, having looked at this very closely over a very long time, I think those are absolutely false claims. It is not the case that one who was not admitted as a diversity candidate on one campus would not have been admitted on another campus. And so the excluded middle in your argument undercuts your argument. You're saying that's the only opportunity the person had, and that's never the case. I could give you countless illustrations of why it's never the case. And moreover, I could give you countless illustrations in which that very practice effectively destroys that same young black man who you're not naming as an individual, but just taking as an archetype experiences on multiple campuses all across the country. And what do we expect when we treat people as archetypes rather than as individuals? We're more concerned with where they came from. One quick story might put this in perspective for you. I taught a seminar once in which, and this was a seminar in which all the participants were young black males. They were rising uh, juniors in college in a summer program. And, and there was one in particular who, uh, consistently inquired, well, I, inquired is the wrong word, who spoke at great length 
and, and consistently argued that the legacy of slavery prevented him doing anything. He couldn't succeed. He couldn't establish himself in the world because he bore the burden of centuries of slavery in himself. And so I said to him in the course of one of his lengthy uh, diatribes, take off your jacket, please, which he proceeded to remove. And then he went on and I said, uh, take your shirt off. He took the shirt off and then went on. I said, take the undershirt off. And then he paused. He said, well, what's going on here? I said, I want to see the scars on your back. At that point, he stopped his diatribe. He couldn't go on. This idea of the inherited burden of slavery is the biggest con game of all time. It is false. How do we know it's false? For one thing, there's no one, not you, nor anyone else alive in this world whose ancestors were not once slaves, serfs, coolies, peasants, you name it. Everybody has that inheritance not just the people who were black and slaves in the United States. When I was being questioned on a radio program by the host, the interviewer, before we started, the interviewer posed a question to me about how the sensibility one needed to be able to explain the film Harriet. And, and she allowed at the time that she didn't have access to that. And she happened to be Jewish. And I asked her, have you forgotten Egypt? She was taken aback naturally, and then immediately recognized, well, yes, of course, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. well, I suppose it's true. The legacy of slavery is not an explanation of the expectations we can have of black individuals in 2020, and has not been so for a very long time. And it's time for everybody to let go of those baseless, empty arguments. They are neither morally persuasive though logically demonstrable. Okay, uh, here's a question. There is a debate among conservatives about how much one can embrace not just the constitutional patriotism, but a thicker American nationalism. What answer would you give to the appropriateness of thicker American nationalism in our constitutional patriotism? When we began this American National Character Project, some people misunderstood it as a project of nationalism, advancing nationalism. And that was a natural misunderstanding. I, I don't have any objection to that. Nationalism is not something to be dismissed as somehow inappropriate. Uh, nationalism is nothing other than the outward expression of what James Madison meant when he referred to national character, because he really meant the sense in which the nation is viewed by the world outside. Washington meant that also, but Washington also meant what was domestic, what was internal. This idea that one has a posture towards the world, that one has a national character that looks outward, is the source of what becomes national. For one stands on the strength of one's reputation in the world. And that a citizen would embrace that with pride, and with devotion and with loyalty, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I don't think that actually describes a conservative or a liberal. I think that describes a citizen. The idea that one would need to somehow disavow one's native land simply because of a party position in the politics of one's country sounds insane and probably is so. Here's a wild card question. It is National Poetry Month. Oh, the American poets past and present whose work would be most effective in opening minds and souls to the important points you have made tonight and in your life. Well, uh, those are separate questions tonight and in my life. Uh, there, there, there is a pendant at the end of these remarks for publication purposes, the two Excelsior poems by Longfellow and Whitman. Uh, which are certainly pertinent to this discussion. And, and I can't go into them. I won't try to read them to you now because uh, they are both, or at least one in particular, relatively long. But it is important to uh, observe that what those poems really try to do is to describe an American national character. 
And since Excelsior was the obvious uh, motto embraced in that tableau that I showed you from the World's Fair, it is a question of whether it was informed by these poems. And so on one you have in Longfellow, the heroic poem. And, and this is the poem of the fellow who carries the banner, carries it high uh, with the excelsior, as it were, uh, inscribed upon it, carries it through every danger and clutches to it even when his life passes away, but someone else comes along to pick it up. And then there's the Whitman poem, Excelsior, the same name, in which he describes someone who has, well, how shall I put this? Who's full of himself, <laughs> who sees himself heroically, who has hymns, as it were, fit for himself, fit for the earth made to himself. And so the question is whether these poems somehow are uh, grasping what Alexis de Tocqueville described when he saw that it was impossible to criticize America to an American. Because he was essentially saying, they are so full of themselves. They, they have such inflated expectations of themselves. And the question is, does the acquisition of a national character necessarily convey a sense of inflated importance? Or, or might it create a composed relationship both with oneself and within one's community and in the world. And so the, the bourgeois virtues that I've listed as the insignia of national character, those all are meant to suggest a composed awareness of oneself, not something that has gotten out of control. And so I would say those two poems, certainly in the context of this lecture, would be important to reflect upon with regard to the questions I'm concerned with. Uh, as to the poetry in my life, uh, that, that, is, that is long, that is rich. Uh, I, can, I, I don't want to settle myself, but, but the only one that I have ever been able to recite from memory for at least 60 years is Sonnet uh, 116. So that, that's it, that, that's who we are, and that's who I am. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, let's see what else I have here. I'm trying to find the next question. Is this it? Uh, okay, I got that one. I don't know why I'm going the wrong way. That's a poetry question. <laughs> okay, I like the nomination of Robert Hayden. I received that in a poetry, uh, poetry exchange on, online a short while ago. Uh, at all events, so, so that's the, I, I think I've exhausted the questions and I probably exhausted you and we're nearing the end of this presentation. So I'm, I'm gonna take the occasion to, to say a special thank you to all of you who were able to participate. And uh, I know that it's so highly unusual for us to do these public lectures in this manner, but it's also very important to know that we will journey on. We will journey on. Thank you and good night to you all.